and I believe we are now broadcasting. Uh, let me go ahead and switch us back. I'm your host, Dave Feldman, and I'm being joined by Dr. Joel Kahn. How are you doing? Good morning. Good. little Vegas fog, but uh, good. <laughs> Turns the brain. Well, you can't come to Las Vegas and not get in a little bit of the nightlife, so... Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you wouldn't be the first person I talked to in the AM who yeah. had a little bit of the uh, the Vegas drive kind of still lingering. I, I can count backwards by seven, so I, I still would pass a neurologic test, but <laughs> I feel uh, East Coast brain and a West Coast Sin City. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure. So uh, we may be just a little a little heads up to the viewer. Uh, we may be a little bit bumpy because I'm actually, this is the first time I've actually done an in-person interview and we oh, really? were sort oh, that's of, cool. yeah, well, where I've been on the side of the interviewer, <laughs> I've uh -huh. been the interviewee. Right, of course. Yeah, several times. But uh, this is the first time where I've actually interviewed somebody, especially for this show. I don't know if I ever wears makeup or not. Uh, well, that's true. That's always possible. That's true. That's cool. Pretty natural, right there. We'll have to get we'll have to get an in person interview with Ivor so I can confirm. <laughs> no disrespect, of course. Uh, so the we're going to go ahead and go toward the um, uh, the bumpers, which again this will this will be bumper itself, and let's let's go ahead and go straight to backstory. Now, of course, I want to know a little bit about how you not only got to uh, where you're at now, but particularly how you've come to understand cholesterol and heart disease in particular, given that's kind of the subject matter of this show. Sure. Um, very brief bio, uh, born and raised in Detroit, uh, retail family business thought was going to be the future, but somewhere like, well, actually I had a heart murmur, started seeing a pediatric cardiologist and that kind of did, did me and I got interested, you know, six years old seeing echo machines and electrocardiograms and, you know, by about 14, 15, I knew where I was headed and the heart tire with my dad. I don't want to drive high lows for the rest of my life and all. That was a very good business. So I got into University of Michigan right down the road. It wasn't a time you applied to 100 schools, applied to one school, but they had a program where you did undergrad and med school combined. Just mm, a quick wow. accelerated program. It doesn't exist anymore. It was partly to streamline, partly to produce more physicians. There was a concern about a physician shortage, which is a concern again right now. Anyways, graduated uh, top of my class. And because of that murmur thing, I just knew I was headed to cardiology and spent another three years in Ann Arbor. Um, and then, then I hunted and next step is to do three years of cardiology somewhere as a fellow, it's called. And that proved to be in the interest in cholesterol, that proved to be Dallas, Texas, major center called University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and the famous hospital, Parkman Hospital where Kennedy was taken. So moved family down, but then young family, wife, a nurse to uh, Dallas for three years. But I arrived in July, 1986 and then November, December of 85, the Nobel Prize of Medicine was awarded to two researchers, right. Brown and Goldstein. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they were you know, highly celebrated members of the medical faculty and you would see them in the halls and we got lectures from them, probably more if you were in medical school there, but still as cardiology fellows. Um, and it was like, that was the time, 86 to 89. I mean, the first statin comes out in 87, Brown and Goldstein kind of put this all together. You know, you, you're starting to hear about trials coming out with various uh, lipid agents. Nobody talks about diet ever. Uh, there wasn't much conversation uh, then, but by 1990, uh, I did one more year of training in Kansas City in angioplasty, stenting, heart attack treatment, exciting stuff. Uh, but by 1990, there was already starting to be evidence-based medicine on the impact of nutrition and lipids and an outcome. Uh, give a shout out to Dr. Dean Ornish in California. So I started practice in 1990, pretty immersed in lipids, but as a clinician, I mean, I'm not a PhD. I don't publish, uh, you know, biochemistry of lipidology. Um, and in fact, it's, it, you know, it's a prescription treatment in cardiology. We don't really get much more training in it. I decided to keep reading, keep pursuing, keep trying to understand. Um, I went through a phase of questioning, you know, the importance of cholesterol. I've got a library full of cholesterol denier books, ra ra Ravenskov and such, uh, but came back, um, you know, to the importance of it in, in what I call a, a composite cause. There's many causes of the thing that I treat most often as a cardiologist, coronary disease and uh, lipids are one of those causes. They're, I do very, very deep and uh, and uh, really specific workups on every patient. And 
I have full appreciation. It is a cause, not the cause of coronary heart disease, but it's an important cause in a lot of people. Um, and I also took a deep dive in nutrition. And, you know, so I now practice cardiology, preventive reversal. Actually, one of the very few people in the country can, you know, like you've done your CIMT, but I mean, I have dozens and dozens and dozens of patients that I can show through their hard work, through their lifestyle, and then sometimes natural supplements and sometimes prescription drugs, you know, major reversal of atherosclerosis, which is crazy wild stuff. And I mean, I don't really publish it, but I will ultimately put it together and uh, do something with it. So I'm here in Vegas at a kind of regenerative anti-aging meeting. This is where I learned a lot of this stuff in the last decade part of the faculty now and lecture thousands and thousands of people down the street. So, uh, I mean, that's kind of the backdrop. I mean, I adopted this last thing to say, total accident of Ann Arbor uh, dormitory food. I adopted a plant diet at age 18. Of course, there wasn't the language, the debate, the wars, the Twitter and all that. It was just Sally Bar was the best thing I could find to survive on. So if it was at 18, and, um, it I'll was be, really... Yeah, I'll be 60 and couple months so it's been you know 42 years of never having a burger chicken and egg but they, but but you could you could correctly claim that you went on a plant-based diet before cholesterol was in the spotlight to the degree that it is now um yeah yeah I mean it was not a reason that I adopted it I had no idea what my cholesterol was at age 18 it was truly a survival tactic and felt good and didn't really make a big deal about it my mother was a little concerned <laughs> what was I doing but she went off and changed the family diet a little bit healthier anyways right then. So if I could um, ask, do you know when your first cholesterol test was then? Because obviously going into medical school, yeah, you probably got it. Um, probably 30. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe I had it before, but you start going to a big national, maybe maybe late 20s, a big national cardiology meetings. And I was doing research not in lipids and other aspects and presenting. You could get your cholesterol check for free at all these meetings. So right. I would imagine. I have a father that had his first coronary kind of diagnosis in his mid fifties. Um, you know, so I was aware of this as through medical school, I can remember, you know, the importance of atherosclerosis as a clinical entity close to home, you know, ultimately it didn't really uh, shorten his life and didn't, wasn't the major driving factor, but um, was aware of it and, you know, just, uh, but I do, I don't have a natural cholesterol of 130. I mean, no matter right. what diet I'm on, it's pretty darn hard to get there. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So what you'll uh, tell me how to do it. What's that? You'll tell me how to do it. Oh yes. Well actually that's uh obviously I'm I'm not only a bit known for that, but I have some future experiments coming up here soon where I'm, I intend to move it around right. uh in in a very dynamic fashion. Right. Uh, and, and I mean different and I'll say this, different than I were different than you. I mean, I still maintain I'm 30, 30 years of practice. I mean, I have a large, robust practice, see patients four days a week. They know, and they're relying on me. I mean, I can't really experiment on them. I do sort of, because I'm using natural cardiology. I practice different than most other cardiologists. I mean, there's a lot less prescription drugs, a lot more lifestyle, a lot more yeah. natural supplements that are based on peer reviewed literature, but unknown to most cardiologists. So I am in a sense, I mean, I'm experimenting with their health based on evidence that I believe is, you know, uh, to, to teach them about nutrition is already out of the norm. But, you know, they, I mean, that's the context of this conversation is, I, you know, there's nothing hypothetical about heart disease is what David Katz, a well-known Yale uh, medical professor talks about. They, you know, the decisions we make, national policy decisions, treatment decisions, one-on-one -on -one doctor patient decisions. I mean, the, the, you want to be as close to right as you can for, uh, for the national budget, for the national health, for the national welfare, and just, you know, as a physician, responsibility to try and give people good advice. And I struggle with that all the time. Am I underusing statins compared to my peers, which I am? I mean, I'm harming people, I'm helping people. So I have to keep going back to the literature and keep asking, you know, what uh, is the current understanding? And, you know, you're part of that. You and Iber and the like, I mean, you know, you got outside the norm, obviously, but there have been people like you that have changed medicine. We can talk about some of them. Um, without medical degrees. Well, and actually, yeah. I, I first of all, thank you. I mean, yeah. to, to at least to recognize to what degree we're moving the needle. Right. And and I and for what it's worth, I actually, I actually bring this up a lot with some of my vegan friends. Is I feel like a lot of times I want to raise money for studying, you know, the special populations I'm looking into, because I feel like if you don't believe the lipid hypothesis, you'd want to study it because you believe you know where the outcome's going to be. If you do believe the lipid hypothesis, 
you should want to fund it <laughs> because you know where you feel the outcome is going to be. Yeah. It's the neat thing is, is we've helped to at least identify um, those people for which the lipid hypothesis is really kind of naked and alone yeah. where there really aren't a lot of other cardiovascular risk factors. Yeah. And you know, that's, that's part of what we'll get into right. in a moment. But, but before we do, I'm going to, I'm going to do something I almost never do. I try to actually avoid uh, the nutrition debate in general yeah. and, and for all technical purposes, I'm, I try to be diet agnostic in that. I don't know what the one true diet is, even if I myself practice a low carb diet. Right. Uh, but I, I do feel pretty confident in this. I do want to say that I commend uh, every doctor on every front for trying to work towards a nutrition based uh, health outcome over one based on medication, especially lifelong medical therapy. That's that's an opinion I don't want to feel like I need to hide, even though I try to be as you know objective as I can be. So to that extent, I, I certainly commend you, and I commend many of uh, your fellows in the same area. If you're if you're looking to resolve health issues by understanding what nutritional completion is mm -hmm. and understanding what it is that can best you know elevate health without doing it through medication, hats off to you. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, maybe it's it's a rabbit trail, but then we can get in. It'll partly answer a few of the questions that you let me preview that came up. Let me take just a couple minutes and give a quick snapshot on 70-year history of nutrition in cardiology and uh, at least what has made an impact on me. Because um, I think it's relevant, and probably most listeners don't know this, but you can, you can go back beyond where I'll start. But during World War II, there was an observation published about 1944, and some of the countries that were under either Nazi occupation or within just the, you know, the turmoil of Europe um, actually had a lower death rate and a lower coronary heart disease death rate during a period you'd think just from stress and illness and infection would skyrocket, Norway being the example particularly. And there was an analysis published right towards the end of World War II that the diet changed radically in Norway, and it was a, a policy of the German government to take animal and livestock back to Germany to feed the troops, feed the citizens, feed the government, and that the diet changed to a uh, much more plant-based, much more kind of garden-based uh, foraging uh, forest diet for two, three years. And as soon as the war was over and livestock were brought back or you know was resumed within a couple of years, the uh, overall uh, disease rates, and particularly coronary heart disease rates, went right back up. Uh, that was noticed by some people, and there's never been anybody that's actually proposed that there should be a Nazi diet or a World War II diet. That would not be a particularly uh, popular title for a book publisher. Um, there was an internist in Los Angeles named Lester Morrison, MD, with a very large practice of cardiology patients in 1944-1945. There was no therapy at the time. There was literally probably not uh, a single you know pharmaceutical drug that was of any benefit. Nitroglycerin, um, you know, diet was. Uh, really unknown. And he said, I'm going to try this on my patients. And he took 100 people who had a heart attack, average cholesterol about 250, just run the mill Los Angeles people, asked half of them to basically reproduce what happened in Norway. And he created a diet sheet and it's on the web and it's ultimately was published in peer reviewed medical literature in 1951, American Heart Journal, good journal, that the 50 that he put on this you know, largely plant-based, very uh, low-fat diet. I mean, he excluded nuts. He excluded olives. And I know there was a question about olives and olive oil and stuff. He excluded creams and glandular meats and all the rest. And that uh, ultimately the 12-year survival of the 50 patients that went on that diet was 50% were alive at a time there wasn't much therapy. It was 0% for those that he assigned. Just continue your diet as you've had, 0 versus 50%. It made a big impact. It actually was discussed all over the place. He has a uh, auditorium at Cedar Sinai Hospital in Los Angeles named after him. He really made a splash, and then he was, you know, forgotten. I don't think one cardiologist in a hundred, if you said who was Lester Morrison, would have a clue who that was. He went off and did some research on phosphatidylcholine and some other areas for the rest of his career. But where I was complimenting you and Ivor was a aerospace engineer in Santa Barbara read the papers. Dr. Morrison, dietary therapy of heart disease seems to have a benefit. And he was curious enough, very much like you, but uh, this is about 1955. He drove down to uh, LA and had his cholesterol checked. It was over 300. Did a little stress test, actually flunked a stress test at age 42 or 43. Mm. And Morrison said, you've got heart disease. You don't make some changes with your cholesterol 325 and your ice cream and your hot dogs and the rest. Uh, you're not going to be here in a year. His name was Nathan Pritikin. And he, much like you, went to the library and started hacking. I mean, he just started reading. There was no internet 
reading, 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 reading. And he copied Morrison's diet and he knew of Norway. And you can go back even further. The crazy Duke doctor named Walter Kempner and the Duke Rice diet had a similar diet plan for heart patients and kidney patients. And Pritikin dropped his cholesterol 200 points within a year. It was hacking, started, you know, walking, started running and really uh, rejuvenated his own health, but he started teaching it. He started teaching it. Now, what he did right. do though, you know, pre-laptop uh, databases, he started accumulating data and he started getting a few researchers with him. And he actually ended up publishing over a hundred papers in medical journals. And he was resistant and he was pushed back and it wasn't a lot of medical meetings. You're an engineer and you know, you can't talk to us medical people. I wouldn't know so anything about that. You wouldn't know anything about being excluded. <laughs> but I mean, he, to this day, there's a Pritikin Center in Miami that's still a, you know, yeah. a respectable center of cardiac treatment. It's still ongoing research. And there's a Medicare approves for a physician to refer a heart patient to a Pritikin cardiac rehab program. It's one of the only two programs out there. So, I mean, he, in the 50s, as a, just a radical thinker, has left a, you know, a real serious impact. There's about 50 Pritikin cardiac rehab programs around the country that, and I refer people to one. And, and then, we, if you want, there's Dr. Dean Ornish, who you, he took all this work but applied modern technology of the late 80s, catheterization, computer analysis, uh, PET scanning of the heart for blood flow, and showed diet had a tr very quickly a tremendous impact on blood flow and a little slower. I, Tremendous impact on you know atherosclerosis and clinical. I think ninety ninety five percent of the people watching right now would like totally agree the diet would have yeah. such an impact yeah. on atherosclerosis. The the question, let we'll we'll agree to kind of close the nutrition discussion okay. part of it. But yeah. uh, but I'll say this that the key question that scientist Dave would want right. answered is with a true randomized control trial where the only thing that was to change was like the subtraction of meat. But right. otherwise, a nutritionally complete diet, because because I've already heard you agree several times over that it, you know standard American diet bottom right? right things above that that are more nutritionally complete right. is almost certainly better. The question then becomes, can you have a nutritionally om, uh, omnivorous diet versus a nutritionally plant based diet? The plant based diet wins through the only intervention change being right. the subtraction of meat and. We honestly don't know that one yet, but we'd like to. I mean, I, I think yeah, all of us would, right? right? You know, you're, it's going to have to be, you know, to repeat some of these clinical studies, probably never be done. I, I don't foresee anybody doing a cardiac trial. There have been some one-year trials recently. There was a trial at New York University, plant-based diet versus American heart standard diet post-heart attack. There was a greater reduction in C-reactive protein with people complying, 100 patients, one-year plant-based diet. Tough study to do expensive study. There's not going to be a lot of them like that. So you have to use surrogate markers. There's a lot of flow mediated dilatation, endothelial function, and now we've got all kinds of biomarkers in the blood. Um, but there isn't a great trial that you're talking about that is simply excluded. Because it's tough. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's tough to yeah. get people to commit to a very long period yeah. of time on yeah. a very specific diet. Yeah, it's, anyway, right. like just that, I mean, people laugh at three week nutrition studies <laughs> and I do you know, hepatic <laughs> fat or, you know, and the rest. But that's about as long, you know, a two month human study is a long nutrition study. I agree. It, it absolutely is. Yeah. Let's go ahead and go to okay. the devil's advocates, uh, three questions that I've got for you. Okay. First one is, and I'm sorry, you can't see this, but I'll just read it no uh, to you. Is there any value of any kind in having high levels of LDL particles in the body? And if so, do current studies account for this when looking at disease outcomes? Yeah. Um, you know, every answer I'm giving you is the best answer that I know. Can't represent that I know everything in the world. It's a pretty hard thing to accomplish, nor do I spend all my day reading only lipid research. You probably are closer to doing that than I am. Um, but when you ask the question, a high LDL particle, no, I'm unaware of any benefit. Um, Brown and Goldstein, I mentioned, did an evaluation in their research that you needed an LDL cholesterol level of about 25. I'm sorry, no this problem. is actually my emergency. I know. Something's I know. wrong. Nicole. What's going on? Hi, Siobhan. How are you? Oh, they are. Okay. Well, thank you for letting me know that. Um, I'll be sure to not use those in the future. All right. Thanks. Bye. Uh, Siobhan just informed me that the slides aren't showing up properly. Um, okay. okay. They're, they're right now showing up as a black screen. Aha. Like uh, we have right there. 
yes, but hopefully you can see us right now. I'm pretty sure you can. Yeah. Again, uh, my apologies. Um, we'll have you prepared seven slides. Right. Every get every guest is to be allotted seven slides. So I would still like you to be able to talk about those slides. Okay. We'll include them in the okay. show notes, um, and we may even make a separate video of this okay. where we actually cut those in as well. Okay. Just no problem. Keep it. We'll just go back. Brown and Goldstein uh, <clears throat> estimated that to support steroid hormones, to support vitamin D production and such. You need an LDL level in the blood of about 25 to accomplish all that. So whatever LDL particle number you want to insert there, it's not going to be a lot, obviously, you know, LDL particle number, a couple hundred, uh, but that wasn't, they didn't, they didn't talk about LDL particle number. But beyond that, I mean, is there any benefit to a high, I'm unaware of any data anywhere. Um, even in the brain health, you know, there's always the debate about the role of lipids to support healthy brain function, uh, but an elevated LDL, you know, we know that we know that cholesterol falls towards the end of life, and there's a lot of potential reasons and reverse causation if people are poor health. But no, um, I would say unknown. Okay, I, for what it's worth, I think probably the most prominently talked about one, without getting into all yeah. the different ones, is the immunologic right. benefit. Right, right, right. And one thing that was often brought up in early on in my research was how those who had familiar hypercholesterolemia seemed to be able to, for example survive pandemics or something along those lines. Right. So usually the counter argument to that was maybe it was more useful during the times where yeah. infection was more prominent and right. now isn't as much. But even so, even to that degree, there seemed to be even modern lipidology conceding that there was some benefit in that case. Would you say even in the case of FH, you wouldn't agree? Well, yeah, little rabbit trail. Um, I've taken care of a lot of FH patients because Dallas, Texas was the place. So mm -hmm. I took care of Stormy Jones. Anybody go look up Stormy Jones, the world's most famous FH patient for many decades, who ultimately died about age 15, but she was one of my clinic patients. Allowed to say it, she was a part celebrity. I ended up having a, a liver transplant and if I recall, and ultimately a heart transplant, but still atherosclerosis was, you know, she was a homozygous. So we just had a whole bevy. Um, I'm, you know, I'm not prepared. I'm not debating it with you, but I don't really know of any data about, you know, it enhancing survival. I mean, those people, I mean, they do not live long, so they might miss a couple of flus, but <laughs> it's not, it's not the way to bulk up your immune function during the winter and much rather you well, eat mushrooms and let, let me, uh, let me qualify that yeah. what you're talking about is homozygous FH right. where virtually every LDL receptor is mutated. Right. Its capability to intake uh, lipoproteins is now uh, highly compromised. Right. Um, the, and you're talking heter yeah, yeah. heterozygous. The, the yeah. heterozygous uh, FH means it's basically every other one. Right. And therefore, there is some degree of bind binding capacity that's capable, but there ends up being resulting higher levels of LDL right. particles. For sure. Uh, so yes, my assumption in that case, well, That'll, that'll take me okay. really to the next number question. two. The next, yeah, number two. So, double uh, advocate. Many who go on a low carb, high fat diet will see their LDL cholesterol go up. Right. You're familiar with this. But will likewise see their HDL cholesterol climb and their triglycerides drop. Right. Uh, is it possible that this will result in a lower cardiovascular disease? Um, it's possible. It needs to be tested. I mean, if this movement continues with the speed it is, I mean, there's, there is an absence of low carb, you know, cardiovascular data uh, that's robust and we need it. It's possible. I mean, I'll just say what you will want to start doing within the next few weeks, I predict, is there is no test available now for HDL functionality and, you know, for the actual measuring of reverse cholesterol transport. Um, that will be available in the next few weeks from one of the commercial vendors, Cleveland Heart Lab. Can't wait. I spoke, the CEO is here and we've all been waiting. Um, they've been waiting to get a paper published. Once the paper's published, they'll move forward with the commercial uh, assay and they've verified it. Uh, so that is the big unknown. I mean, in, in HDL in the world of cardiology is pretty much off the table. I mean, drug development and everything else because it's been so disappointing and there clearly are, and you know the data, but so many people with HDLs of 70, 80, 90, 100, 110 with, you know, clear cut atherosclerosis. It, you know, and why was it said by people you know, Bill Castelli, the head of the Framion study in the, you know, in the 60s, you know, that basically you were, you know, bulletproof if your HDL was elevated in terms of developing atherosclerosis when, you know, what has changed about human physiology in 50 years? 
uh, is it do we live in a more toxic environment and HDL is there, it's just not working, which may be the case. That will get to TMAO is one of the actions of TMAO and make sure HDL less functional or non-functional uh, in basic science studies. So, I mean, you know, but TMAO is not new, it's just new that we can measure it, we can talk about it, but you know, what in the environment is uh, stunned or, uh, or, or, or at least caused, uh, you know, these middle-aged women with HDLs of 110 to have double the rate of atherosclerosis of women with normal HDLs. So I've been curious about that though, yeah. because I would want to, for example, rule out alcoholism. That of course is known for bringing yeah. up HDLs yeah, substantially. Yeah, this, and this yeah. is kind of, and this is really kind of getting to the heart of it is a lot of the core of my research is, is there a bad reason H LDL can be high? Right. But is there also likewise a good reason LDL could be high? And I suspect they're not mutually exclusive for that matter. You could have it up for a good reason and for a bad reason. Right. But the thing I key in on is, granted, they're not very uh, exacting markers. Right. But even looking at the triad of those three, looking at LDL, right. HDL, and triglycerides, I have yet to find any evidence where that triad went together. When you have high LDL, high HDL, low triglycerides, results in a population of high cardiovascular disease. Yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a spectrum. The question is, you know, if you're searching for longevity and you're searching, I mean, one of the best ways to achieve longevity is to have the cleanest arteries you can. And there's a concept of arterial age. It goes back hundreds of years and it's measurable easily with CIT and calcium scoring and other uh, femoral ultrasound. I mean, is, is a high LDL alone enough to cause atherosclerosis? I think that certainly the conventional wisdom is it is, even with a optimal HDL and a low triglyceride, that, that it is it, it, the only necessary you know, um, component uh, to drive atherosclerosis. You compound it with smoking, compound it with hyperglycemia, <laughs> compound it with hypertension. But There's a joke Richard Morris would insert here where he'd say, well, also, arteries are the only necessary component for atherosclerosis right, 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 as yeah. well. <laughs> There's a, if anybody wants to read, you know, get into the conventional literature, William Roberts is the world's leading cardiac pathologist. He's a man in his late 80s. is at Baylor Medical Center in Dallas. One of my professors years ago published 1,500 peer-reviewed papers. He's the editor of a major journal. And he has written for decades that... Although there's a multitude of you know established risk factors for atherosclerosis, there's only one that's absolutely necessary, and that's LDL cholesterol. And you know, um, if your LDL's you know 40 and you smoke, you're much less likely to have atherosclerosis than if your LDL's 140 and you smoke because injure your endothelium and have the necessary. But you you, know, you brought up longevity, yeah. which is actually is a good segue into our third okay, and final go for it. Uh, devil's advocate question. So. Many studies tout changes in risk for cardiovascular disease mortality, yet show no difference in all-cause mortality. Yeah. Doesn't this run the risk of misleading people to assume an overall benefit where there is none? Yeah, you know, it's a broad question. You'd have to go topic by topic, study by study. I mean, one would hope that if you lower cardiovascular mortality, you're also going to demonstrate all-cause mortality. Yeah. I, that was when you go back in the history of lipid trials um, called the Helsinki Heart Trial that used a triglyceride lowering drug, um, Jim Fiprazole. And this was maybe about 1984, 85, 86. And I remember how exciting it was the Helsinki Heart Trial got published that we have an agent that not just lowers a lipid fraction, but actually lowers you know, serious marker like cardiac mortality. But it didn't touch all cause mortality. And that was in the 80s. There was a lot of talk. Lower cholesterol and suicide, lower cholesterol and depression, you know, and it really put a chill. Inhibitors, for example. Right. And it put a chill until a few years later when the first statin came in the market. And but ultimately, not that long after, 1994, it was the 4S study, Simvastatin Survival, Swedish study, got the order of those words wrong. Um, that demonstrated, you know, serious cholesterol lowering, serious cardiovascular disease mortality, and all cause mortality. It really wasn't until 4S hit the field that, you know, the whole world of statins and physicians got, I think, appropriately convinced that uh, this pharmacology was something to adopt routinely. And until then, there was a lot of questions. I mean, including, I, as I said, I had a lot of questions because, you know, why is that? You, know, you don't want to make, you don't want to drive people's depression and suicide rate up. But it's just that that topic is just dead in the water. I mean, it's really not been reproduced uh, that is seen with modern lipid therapy hasn't hasn't been reproduced. What you're using? Though. Yeah, with the, you know with uh, now seven statins, now two uh, PCSK9 inhibitors, 
um, that in any trial, an increased rate of suicide or serious depression is a side effect to deal with. So, I mean, I don't know if it was unique to the population studied in Helsinki, if it was unique to the drug um, or that specific cohort of people. Well, if you um, but, but, so the point is you can demonstrate all cause mortality. Um, but, you know, I, again, when one doctor and one patient, you really have to apply, you know, as broad as sweep of the literature is synthesized within the minute you have to deal with that topic or five right. minutes. Um, and the broad sweep is, I think there's, you know, that LDL is causal and that lowering LDL is a benefit to people with established atherosclerosis. Hold on the topic to people that you take the time to determine that they're free of atherosclerosis. And, and in that sense, are you talking more, not whether they have atherosclerosis, not whether it's secondary prevention or not. And sorry for the viewer, by secondary prevention, as in they've already had uh, an event. Yeah, so there's three terms. There's primordial prevention, the idea of uh, teaching at a very young age a healthy lifestyle so you never develop hypertension, never develop diabetes, never develop, yeah, obviously don't adopt smoking. Maintaining your youthful low cholesterol for life, that's called primordial prevention. Primary prevention is you have hypertension, you have diabetes, you have hyperlipidemia, you have obesity. Um, how do you manage it without having an event down the road of a stroke, heart attack, or premature death. And then there's secondary prevention. You've had your stroke, you've had your heart attack. Slides are working. Did they? Oh. Um, I appear to be. I don't know if the viewers can see it, but. Uh, maybe this slide. Maybe they can see it. OK. I hope they can see it. I, I'm pretty yeah, sure sh sh this I is one call. you definitely float a, uh, float a lot. We'll, we'll talk about it if you want to real quick. OK. Um, this is. Uh, yeah, this is, uh, you know, and I. Spent time picking seven slides last night. I didn't spend uh, months. Uh, it's just very representative. This is a fairly modern study from Madrid called PESA. Um, it's 4,000 bank workers that uh, agreed to have testing for silent atherosclerosis. These people haven't had a stroke. They haven't had a heart attack. So they get carotid ultrasounds. They get calcium scoring. They get femoral ultrasounds looking for any evidence of atherosclerosis and they get blood work and they have multivariate analysis of what predicts it, the presence of atherosclerosis. And if I recall, there was about 40% rate of silent atherosclerosis in the cohort. We got a ding. We'll see if our... <laughs> no, keep talking. Okay. Oh, she said uh, slides are working. Okay. There was on average, you know, anybody listening, it's relevant. Um, you know, silent atherosclerosis is known to start in your teens, 20s, 30s, it's only a matter, are you testing for it? And you not, it's not blood work, it's imaging. Are you imaging arteries in the carotids, the legs, the heart? And you know you don't necessarily want to apply CAT scan too, too routinely because of radiation, but the others are pretty available. It's just not part of the medical model to be searching for silent atherosclerosis in your, in your 20s and your 30s. But if you're bothered to do that in this relatively young cohort of relatively healthy Spaniards, um, the 40% silent atherosclerosis rate, I think it's highest in the legs. Uh, the least frequently abnormal test was the coronary calcium. Probably it's a later stage of atherosclerosis to be calcified. But LDL cholesterol tracked the presence of silent um, atherosclerosis even after adjusting for both lifestyle habits, blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol. Now, they didn't do advanced markers. There's, uh, you there know, was, there was another. It's thing. not an intervention trial. This is a, a, you know, a recent analysis of the role of LDL. Well, and there was another yeah. thing that I, I just literally tweeted on that particular study this week, and I had got, I'd found in the supplemental that they had a much greater significance on the triglyceride side, but they didn't make it part of no, the. No, no. Yeah, part of the paper. Yeah, well, part of the qualify. Well, they did make it part of the paper, and that they included those metrics yeah, along the side. In the summer, and the. Uh, but they had, but what they determined to be low risk was uh, a criteria that included HDL, but didn't include triglycerides. And yet, when they tracked triglycerides, it had a much, a much greater relevance than the LDL, which uh -huh. doesn't surprise me, given uh, what I've learned up to this point. Right. But it's yeah. y you understand, and I and I mean to say this in the most congenial way possible. Yeah. There's. There's one side that believes, you know, scientists are are absolutely good-hearted and generally objective across right. the board. You've got another side that's like, you know, that's money grubbing. It's entirely, right. um, it's entirely a fixed game, et cetera. Right. 
the truth is probably somewhere in between, and it's pro and, and I myself think most people genuinely who who believe the lipid hypothesis really do believe the lipid hypothesis yeah. and aren't trying to um, intentionally shoot down everything. But that said, uh, it's things like this that kind of fuel that other side, right? right? It's it's things like this is why when I'm asking for the triad, I get frustrated because I come from the land of technology where we're just awash in free data. So we're so I just want to go over to some machine and just do a little search on Mesa or do right. a little search on uh, Pure or something along those lines, and there's lots of firewalls to getting there. But if that's if that's really true, if that triad of data is there, that's obviously very relevant to the low carb community. Right. It's actually very relevant well, to the plant based community as well. Yeah. Right. Because you know, in in many studies, they're not as large as this one. But right, HDL falls, triglycerides go up, and yet you can document. Reversal of atherosclerosis on a plant-based diet. Well, and I'll, I'll even, it's small little changes. I mean, triglycerides go up 30, 40 points, but they go up on a plant-based diet. But, but that's that's very relevant to me for people on a plant-based diet who then start ignoring their triglycerides. I have a friend yeah. who his LDL was very low. Yeah. His triglycerides were through the roof. Right. He says it doesn't matter yeah. because I've, I've heard that once it's below 70, I'm basically bulletproof. And yeah. I said, I... I respectfully disagree with that yeah. opinion. I, I would I would agree with you on that. I would want to know. I mean, I do his thyroid studies. I think omega three is a big issue for everybody. It's a big issue for plant eaters. But I draw omega three. That's levels. funny you mentioned that. That ended up being one of the big yeah. things that brought it way down. Yeah, I'll, you know, typically it's interesting when again your viewers may not know uh, this data as well, or may they do it real well. But Dean Ornish, MD, took this concept that atherosclerosis might be reversible with lifestyle, got enough funding to do a randomized study that initially had one-year follow-up and then five-year follow-up um, using the state-of-the-art technology, catheterization, quantitative computer analysis of the degree of stenosis, PET scan perfusion of the heart. Um, and the patients that were on, and it was, it's fair to say, I don't know if it's criticism, it wasn't diet-only study. It was a plant-based diet. It was lifestyle. It was walking. It was social support. Encouraged people not to smoke. And the study was done through the 80s and published in 1990 and 1998. But everybody was on four grams of omega-3 fish oil because at the time they weren't algae, we didn't know much about GN flax, mm -hmm. some of the things that a plant-based doctor might recommend to patients nowadays. And Dr. Ornish's mentor was a guy named Alexander Leaf, who was the world's leader at Harvard in omega-3 physiology and pharmacology. So even with four grams a day, uh, there still was a trend of a slight increase in triglycerides as you shifted your diet off of animal products onto solely plant products. So uh, when people don't pay that kind of attention to omega-3 supplementation, I can see their triglycerides going up a lot more. And I do think it's a mistake. Yeah. I mean, I, but it, it applies, it pertains to the general public too, because I mean, I just, it's routine to see in my lab, omega-3 normal general lab levels of 5.5% above. And, a lot, a lot of, you know, omnivores in my practice and their levels are 1.5 or 2. I mean, these are seriously deficient omega-3 people. Um, it's not just plant eaters. It's a nutrient that has become, you know, unless you're a, a regular fatty fish, deep water fatty fish eater, you're probably low. Right. Well, and to be fair, on both directions, <clears throat> occasionally people want to know if their LDL is bad, read some of my work and then go, I don't think I need to pay attention to my lipid panel at all because right. of reading some things and I've never said that. Right. And on top of that, usually a lot of times when people bring it, they're not focusing on triglycerides and HDL yeah. when obviously that's a big focus of mine. Right. And just to go back to what your point, I mean, there's a lot of money in medicine. Like right, I mean, there's a bunch of things to say real quick. I mean, six of the seven statins right now are generic. I mean, they are cheap. There's no longer billions and billions and billions being made on the stat market. There's only one called Live Alo that's not used much. That's still uh, name brand and you know some more expensive and making money for a pharmaceutical house. The two PCSK9 inhibitors, Proluent and Repatha, which are unbelievably effective at lowering LDL and right now very uh, low in side effect and showing to have benefit, um, were crazy. Uh, expensive for you know, actually compared to cancer drugs or not the fourteen thousand dollars a year many cancer chemotherapy agents are a hundred thousand dollars a year and up but they weren't selling well and there was pushback you're too expensive physicians weren't adopting them so they just dropped the price to six grand a year I and mean, when do you ever see that I mean that there's actually a responsible response by Amgen and Sanofi there's money in medicine let's go back to that I do agree with you the majority of people that are sitting down to create 
you know, consensus papers for the practitioner to advise your mother what to do with her cholesterol are not doing it because they've had a trip to Hawaii. Those things exist. Right. They, they exist a lot less than they used to. There are pretty ladies and handsome guys that show up at your office to, you know, demo you and the latest drug and bring lunch. It influences you. I mean, I wish there were lifestyle people that were coming by, you know, there's money, but I, I think mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's such a serious problem that like the PESA study, the senior author is Valentin Fuster. I mean, I'm friendly with him. He's the one of the most prominent cardiologists in the world is it? I think NYU, it's in New York. If you want access to that data, I can put you two together and maybe you can get raw data on the triad and see what you can you know, come of it. Or maybe it has been looked at, but it just hasn't been published. I don't think, I mean, there's no, I can't imagine a conspiracy theory where I could think why Valentin Fuster would not want to popularize that a low HDL high triglyceride subgroup was bit more predictive. Of I, I am. I, be, like, but, I likewise yeah. wouldn't necessarily push. I yeah. would float that so much. What 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 I think um, what I think the case is that's made the generous case right. is people can easily be distracted by what they're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. So right. so a lot of times whenever I talk about the triad, right. a lot of other people will jump in and say, Ah, this is, I totally think that they know about it. They're just sitting on this data. That's why they're making it so hard to get right. to, et cetera. And I always push back and I'm like, no, I've worked with senior engineers my whole life. Yeah. The smartest people you can imagine that you could put in a room yeah. and they can miss a line of code that's in front of everyone's eyes, but it's because they were distracted by what they were looking for. They had their pet things that they thought were the most important. Right. And so a lot of times this is where um, I think it can be helpful occasionally when somebody from the outside, we, we often actually had a term for this, we called it the junior in the room. So you get like, you know, yeah. a cloud ops group and they're all like trying to figure out what's going on with why this server array is failing. And then some junior engineer goes, oh, gosh, well, I mean, isn't the problem going to be, and I could say something technical, but I won't, yeah. but he, uh -huh. he spots something that fresh eyes can right. catch that are not just fresh eyes, but they're just outside of the box entirely. Yeah. And a lot of times that's what helps. And that's why I wanted to put forth something that's falsifiable. Yeah. So this can be proven wrong easily. If we can get into right. like three different data sets and then boom, 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 it fails all three times, that would be very meaningful. Right. Yeah. Well, we, and we can make something out of this conversation and make that happen. Absolutely. So yeah. um, are you ready for some, some questions? Let's go for it. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, jump on over to uh, the first question. It's going to be from Respectful Living, who I think is. Uh, yeah, he's maybe. actually, he or she <laughs> is on Twitter. Actually, right. I don't be a no. Uh, it asks, aren't all ApoB lipoproteins atherogenic? Yeah. And, and the answer is yes, they are. Um, that uh, whether they're, you know, in I, IADL, LVLDL, LDL, which is 90% of them, um, uh, and, uh, you know, lipoprotein little a, they are all atherogenic in studies that are done. They all have the ability to cross the endothelial wall and be trapped subintimally and set up the process. They don't have to be oxidized in the blood and get oxidized in the subintimal space, uh, but they all are. And I think that's the answer to the question. Um, <laughs> you know, I can't quote you. I mean, I, I can see the slide at the American College of Cardiology in the last 12 months that has that as a title. And I know there's lots of data behind it. Which number I, slide is, is it in your path? Oh, no, it's not in these. So, oh, you know, gotcha. that's a slide I can, if anybody Googles, because it is there, if you Google the, uh, are all ApoB particles atherogenic? You will see the slide from the American College of Cardiology. It's a bunch of little circles show up. Gotcha. Uh, but I just remember if the reference is James Atvis, a researcher, I think that's what You would was. agree, though, that there's plenty of data behind remnant uh, lipoproteins yeah. being far more associated with atherosclerosis than LDL particles in particular. And LD, they run the, yeah, they're for this part of that being, yeah, no, no, LDL right, right, yeah, LDL, LDL minus, right. Uh, the, yeah, they're more atherogenic, they're just far less frequent. Like, I, I myself, and right. it, because this is very interesting, this is of enormous interest to me, obviously. Right. I know a lot of people have very high LDLP. I have very high LDLP, right, but very low levels of remnants, right. I have yet to see any study for which when they're put against each other, remnant cholesterol to LDL yeah. cholesterol or, or lipoproteins that it shows a higher degree of atherogenesis 
when yeah, I don't think remnants. I don't are think anybody's looked at it. I couldn't find. You may know. I tried glyceride HDL ratio study versus LDLP. I mean, I'm not. No, no I, I want one. I don't. You know, I know. <laughs> I don't think there's. I really was surprised by that. Because that data that has. Mesa? Yeah, right. It has to be there. At Mesa. It has yeah. to be. There's one called the uh, Framingham Offspring Study. They have the same data, and they have imaging data too. So you could really. Yeah. No. Be great. Let's yeah. let's move to the next question. Yeah, and I, I just say. You guys talk nonstop about triglyceride HDL ratios. I mean, your doctor will not be talking triglyceride HDL ratios. They might, but it'd be very unusual. It's There's brand new lipid guidelines that came out for the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, 47 worldwide lipid experts. It's not in the 70 page document. I mean, it's right. not the language. Um, you know, and it, part of that is. Right or wrong, doc's got a few minutes to deal with a lot of topics, have to make a decision, and we have a therapy that lowers LDL. We have a lot of basis to believe that that helps patients with atherosclerosis. On to the next one. Uh, add another biomarker that they now got to calculate or it's on the report and they got to deal with, it changes the medical model, and that may not be you know, perfect, but, uh, but it's, it's a reality. If it works, yeah. it works, it's great. Now, I'll actually add something to this that you may like, that right. actually respectful living may like. Right which is following my energy model through to its logical conclusion, there may actually be a case made for why people on a plant-based diet, or for that matter, just on a healthy carb-based diet, right. may actually have a, an appropriate physiological reason to have lower HDL relative to the average population. That actually may be very relevant, yeah. uh, particularly as say You don't need as much because you're not driving as much atherosclerosis, you don't need as much reverse cholesterol transport. That is obviously flattering yeah. us plant eaters, but that is a conversation. If you've got another H biochemical explanation. Yeah, HDL species, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'll point you to some papers. Yeah. Uh, Siobhan has a great one where it's, I mean, it breaks out all of these different tasks that they're involved with, uh, including yeah. the immune system, yeah. very, very intimately. Very intimately in the immune um, system. And so the question is, does some proportion of HDL's activity associate with uh, lipolytic activity with uh, delivery of triglycerides and so forth, not to get yeah. a bit technical, yeah. but I suspect that it does because certainly I influence it a lot from the other direction. Yeah. And if that's true, then it may be that there's a certain margin with which HDL cholesterol could be lower in people who are plant-based that it's not as deleterious as other populations right. that you would be looking at okay. just in that fraction. Got so it. just that. Okay. Uh, Marcus asks, question for Joel, apart, apart from heart disease, what is the main concern you see with being a hyper responder. So this population we're talking about that we right. high LDL. Um, other than heart <clears throat> disease, and, and I'm going to be broad, that includes cerebrovascular, you know, atherosclerosis, femoral atherosclerosis, renal atherosclerosis, aortic aneurysms, all spectrum, although coronary heart disease and your risk of having a heart attack is just the big, the big portion of it. Um, probably brain disease. There is more and more evidence that the risk factors conventionally for cardiovascular disease are the risk factors for Alzheimer's. Um, you know, people will refer to it on occasion as type 3 diabetes and the role of uh, hyperglycemia on brain health long term is well known, whether it's advanced glycation end products, whether it's actually small vessel atherosclerosis, uh, whether it's oxidative stress, but it tracks uh, blood sugar, but it tracks a whole spectrum. So um, an elevated LDLP, um, although it's probably just a standard lipid profile, has been associated with uh, an increased risk of Alzheimer's in many, many studies. Um, and, you know, there is a big debate going on about keto and Dale Bredesen versus more traditional cardiovascular risk reduction with more whole food, plant-based, you know, American heart Mediterranean mm -hmm. diets on brain health. So totally different topic, although it may not be different though. It may be small vessel, uh, blood supply and micro infarcts and this kind of the language that's popular. These things aren't resolved, but they, you know, we, you could you have the same Mesa data, you know, if we jack it up 30, 40 year older people and you'd be tracking a lot of the same stuff for right now. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Yeah. Uh, Iver asks, I wonder who Iver is. So no. <laughs> none, any all caps, the yeah. none yeah, of know. the risk calculators use LDL at all. Why? Why do they all show low, low risk as long as HDL is high and no blood pressure issues, et cetera? Even and, when total cholesterol and LDL are super high. And I'll just say, when I tweet something out in all caps, usually keto and carnivore people yell at me that you're being obnoxious using all caps. I don't really get <laughs> if there's a Twitter code that I violated, but I've violated it at least in an email. So I want to point out now I feel a little bit better about that. 
Um, it's probably, and again, I didn't develop, there aren't a lot of calculators. There's the um, American College of Cardiology risk calculator, Framingham risk calculator, Reynolds score, which is the c vector protein. And there's a brand new one. You may know it. I don't know if your audience says astrocharm.org. You know that one? I think this I've is heard. this is the this is about and I'll get to the answer real quick. But this is the latest greatest risk calculator, astrocharm.org. Weird word, one long word. It's from NASA. You like the geeks and NASA and where I train, University of Texas, so Western Medical Center. They got together a big database. It's just another risk calculator, but it adds in C-reactive protein, which is what's called the Reynolds risk score, and it adds in calcium score. That's the big advantage. They had enough of the mm. database. So, you know, Ivor will like it. He will like it because you can have a calcium score of zero and a high LDL, and you can uh, calculate you know, a risk greater than average. It's not going to be as great as if your calcium score is 100 and your LDL is up. Uh, yeah, something, it something. allows you to put a calcium score in a zero. You know, so they had a big database and they had enough numbers. So LDL is a calculated number. And I don't make these risk scores, but I believe. You know, the people that do know that there is, there are faults in using calculated LDL and there's discordance and um, you know you're not going to get advanced lipid profiles in these big uh, panels and you're not getting them on patients routinely. It's not standard practice to get a NMR lipid profile or used uh, to be called a VAP. We don't do that anymore. It's out of business. Um, so you, you know you got to make risk calculators that are applicable to the average doc and the average patient uh, during a visit. So. If you're not going to use LDL to calculate a number, I mean, what are you left with? Total cholesterol, which isn't such a bad, you know, marker to track atherosclerosis in large populations. There's always in individual N of ones, people with high total cholesterol that don't have atherosclerosis. Everybody, you know, these are risk calculators. They're not, you know, disease identifiers. You want to identify the disease, you better look at an artery and image it. But it is true. And I, I believe that's why it's a calculated number. We all know that. Friedenwald's, you know, uh, equation. Uh, Joe asks, as a promoter of fasting and uh, yeah. the belief that increased LDLC is harmful, what do you make of the data that shows LDLC going up during fasting? Um, it doesn't. So, you know, uh, I, previewed, I previewed that question. Um, you know, to say fasting now is, um, is not specific enough because it's just too broad a term. And there's different, you know, the, the, the world of research on fasting is exploding. Um, the conference that I'm at here in Vegas, it's probably the hottest topic in integrated medicine right now is fasting as an add-on to a lot of other things, to chemotherapy, to uh, cardiovascular disease, to brain health. Um, so, I mean, are we talking time-restricted feeding, 12, 14, 16, 18 hours every day? Are we doing everyday calorie restriction? Are we doing alternate day fasting uh, as is popular? Or what is the hottest right now is five-day periodic fasting. I don't know if you know the work of Walter Longo, but five days in a row, about 800 calories. Um, essentially, no sugar, very low protein, calorie mix of real food, returning to your diet of choice after five days. So actually, cholesterol goes, that, that, and that's where I'm going. With a five-day periodic fasting mimicking diet used three months in a row, uh, cholesterol goes down. Um, not at, at, at the end. At the end of three months. Yeah, they, I'm going with what the published data is. You know, okay. Uh, they that was. Do a, they do they track on a per day or do they track yeah, at the no, end of the? You're the only months. person in the world that tracks per day. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's true. No, I mean they track at the end of three months. Um, and oh, they, I see. At the yeah. so yeah. they didn't even track at the end of the five day period. No, no, okay. no. Gotcha. Um, very few people. So I mean, this is. Cute little point you'll have to figure out. The only place in medicine I've seen in my career discuss rapid drops in cholesterol is if I get a blood draw on you today and don't do this, but you have an acute myocardial infarction, a heart attack this afternoon, and I check your cholesterol six hours after you arrive in the hospital, your cholesterol can drop 100 milligrams of deciliter in you know six to 12 hours, mm -hmm. which is one of the flaws in the study. You know, 50% of people having a heart attack don't have high cholesterol. Well, if you draw, it will go up in about a week. It'll go back up. But if you draw a cholesterol on emission or in the first 24 hours on emission and your cholesterol is 140, it could have been 240 just the day before. It's an acute stress response. I've actually, so, it's actually why I've always been shy about sharing that one is I would have, what I would have liked is yeah. I would have liked for there to be a comparison on everybody who admitted to capture their last taken cholesterol test. Right. That would have been nice because yeah. then we could have gotten a lot more good data out of that. Exactly. But it confuses. So that's a, just the reason I bring that up. It's the only case where we ever discuss in conventional medicine, rapid, rapid drops. 
and not never day to day. So, you know, it'd be very typical in a research study to just get a baseline in a three month lipid, you know, hemoglobin A1C changes in about three months. That's a good time span to look at that impact, which also drops quite seriously. So I don't totally agree with the question that it goes up. I mean, if you're doing a water fast over five, six, seven, eight days, I, there's published data from a center in um, Santa, Ro Santa Rosa, north of uh, San Francisco called True Health, True Health, uh, True North, I'm sorry. It's a center of water fasting. They lower cholesterol after three weeks of water fasting. But after, after three weeks, I'm, I'm yeah. curious about, so this, this, is, this would be my expectation right. in general. Granted, I haven't worked with a lot of people on a carb-centric diet. Right. But my expectation would be as you're moving into ketogenesis, there is a short-term phase for which I would expect fatty acids to be higher right. uh, for trafficking. In fact, I even joke this is the endogenous ketogenic diet. Mm -hmm. Right. And then there's a long-term like, oh, we're in some kind of a famine state or something along those lines to the extent to where it's going to downregulate a lot of these. There's And it's it's catching up with itself in a sense. Right to where I wouldn't be surprised for cholesterol to go down. As I typically say all the time, I like uh, cholesterol because I feel like feel like it's the gateway drug to the larger energy metabolism mm -hmm. for me because it's like a handy tracer. Yeah. It's right. a tracer on these VLDLs that eventually remodel to LDLs. Right. That's where the debate starts because some people be like, no, I think there's just more LDLs being generated, but I think there actually is a lot to say for more VLDLs. Right. And that's why this conversation is so relevant is if I'm wrong in my cautious optimism, and it turns out, yeah, LDL particles, regardless of how you got there, are atherogenic, it's very relevant to the low carb community. Very right? relevant. That's going to be a I big agree. deal to every hyper responder. I, I, I agree. And, you know, I give shout outs to Peter Tia and a few others that keep raising this point that, you know, it isn't inherently harmless to walk around with an LDLP of 3,000 just because you're on a low carb diet. No, you need more work. We, yeah. don't, we don't know. We don't know. That, no. So uh, DMC Fence asks, why is high LDL, why, okay, why is high LDL is bad if there is no oxidation or inflammation present? On that note, is TGH slash HDL a better marker for coronary disease? Yeah. So we touched on that a little bit. I will tell you, since you're in Vegas and not all your listeners are, but Peter T is speaking at this conference tomorrow morning. I don't okay. know if you've ever heard him talk. He's the keynote tomorrow. Um, I've heard him talk yeah, yeah. in person as well as uh, Every, yeah, I've yeah. yeah, I've read, you know, read his straight dope on cholesterol a number of times. That's um, great. So the question centers around, um, again, you're, you guys are so geeky. I mean, me you can measure oxidized LDL. I do in my practice. It's on my panel. Um, it's not frequently elevated. Um, I'm surprised by that. Uh, and it's really very often somebody extremely low in omega-3 um, and very correctable to supplement their omega-3, whether they're plant eaters, meat eaters, doesn't matter, but their oxaldale may be up. They just smokers, they just have a tremendous oxidant burden. Um, you can measure it. Docs in general, 98% of patients with cardiovascular disease don't ever have their oxidized LDL measured. Uh, despite the central role that it plays in atherogenesis, Daniel Steinberg, US, UCSD, is kind of the king of that during his whole career. Um, my understanding is LDL can be retained in the subintimal space, uh, whether it's oxidized or not. I mean, it's really, it's a particle-driven event to enter there. Once it's you know, it's a, the response to retention model is the fancy word for the atherosclerotic model that fairly most uh, lipidologists are, you know, giving most uh, weight to. But, but I'm one, curious about that. Has yeah. that, how demonstrated has that been where a, a healthy endothelial, a healthy endothelium that's got transcytosis of these LDL right. particles coming in and out will just naturally have one of them get stuck in atherogenesis videos? How well established? It's well. Actually, I think slide seven. If you want to pull it up, I, I cheated because I put two slides on one PowerPoint. Uh, I still call them slides because I'm old. I know they're not. I don't know what you call them. Now. Hopefully, this is going to work. And this will it will not project well. I it don't. Just, yeah, think I don't think it's going to be me, seen. Let me try. But it, it actually me. is the res the response. I see it there, but it's uh, yeah. It seems like whenever I go uh, full screen, it's a problem. Let me actually see if I can just blow this up yeah. a little bit further. Uh, oh no, wrong way. There we go. There we go. Okay. What, you see it? I don't see it. Oh, you, I'm sorry. That's uh, okay. 
I don't know. So I don't know if your viewers are seeing it, if it's off your laptop or their laptop. A lot of technology here. Okay. Well, but, I'm going to make sure you can see it, and then I'm yeah. actually going to switch it back to us for us. Okay. Uh, but you're describing through what's going to be slide seven yeah. in the pack that we'll make that's a supplemental for this. Yeah, no problem. But, you know, and the reference is there if anybody wants to read further. But that is a diagram uh, with, you know, lumen at the top with LDL. And it does not require oxidized LDL to be transported, you know, passively into the submittable space. Um, and but that's, it, but that's a part of the existing process, right? Like that's actually by design. Exactly. Well, you know, the odds of that happening and the number of LDL particles that will be in the subventable space will be proportional to the number of LDL particles that are in the lumen in the blood. Um, and some will be, you know, and they do not have to be oxidized LDL to be there and be trapped. Um, in Let fact, me, a very small portion of LDL particles are oxidized. Can I get confirmation yeah. on what you just said? You're saying there'll be a proportionality between the total concentration that's in the blood to that which ends up in the subendothelial space. Right. And some will dissipate out back into the lumen, but some will be engulfed by macrophages and start the process and become oxidized and create inflammation, create foamy cells. And, you know, it's just... Let, you know, if that were the case, it, it would absolutely be a strong correlation, not a weak correlation, between total LDL particle count and that which shows up in the subendothelial. Like you would absolutely get atherosclerosis almost everywhere in the, and throughout the vascular system, right? Throughout the arteriovascular system. Yeah, I yeah, should say right, through yeah, the arteriovascular system. Right, that's a whole different. There is a biomechanical component, which is why veins almost never. You take a vein, you put it in an arterial right. system, it gets atherosclerosis because biomechanical injury from repeated blood pressure. But shouldn't just about anywhere, down. especially everywhere where there's shear stress, shouldn't they all be atherosclerotic if the concentration, the gradient drives it into the subendothelial space, particularly given the total turnaround. Right. We're talking about these things are measured in quintillions. Right. Um, so why, why would it only, you know, show up in spots? Well, it does, it, you use the word shear stress. I mean, atherosclerosis is much more common at branch points. I mean, we much more common in proximal portions of vessels, except than distal, except for diabetics. Diabetics get diffuse atherosclerosis, and I'm referring predominantly to coronary arteries. I mean, coronary arteries, proximal disease, far more common, which is unfortunate because that puts the whole myocardium that's subtended by that artery at risk. Uh, and yeah, the left anterior descending much more atherosclerotic than the other two, and that's probably biomechanical. Just the force of the heart smacking into the LAD is much more direct and not subtended by a bunch of curves. Um, so you get the full force. And branch points, um, which is classic that at the branch point of the left anterior descending and its first branch called the diagonal, that, you know, and again, that just puts 50% of the myocardium at risk, but that is the single most common source. So it, it requires um, some mechanical and some biochemical injury to, you know, and again, slowly and progressively. And that's, yeah, that's the thing, the injury. Like yeah. that from, again, the, me just being an engineer here. Right. I'm, what I'm seeing is by sheer volume, um, as is typically the case with something with physics, you, you would start to anticipate that, yeah, like a pipe that corrodes, right? right. If it's about a gradient, you would see accumulation that's very measurable and trackable, yeah. right? And so the, you know, the subendothelial space thickening and becoming atherosclerotic, I would expect to be more dispersed. So we, sure, there's some areas, for example, for which the shear stress is higher right. than lower. I, there may be a greater consistency from one patient to the next, but even so that consistency still looks almost lottery like in that there just happen to be say, you know, one or four or five atheromas that start developing where you would expect that it would just be all throughout yeah. that area, right? right. Like the, um, and it's, it's se it seems from a distance, and this isn't me imposing, it seems from a distance that there seems to be more and more that says there's some further portion that has to do with endothelial damage or dysfunction that may well, be a bigger component right. to all of this. Right? I was going to get there because, you know, that is, I mean, again, the theme, and the question is, is LDL not a factor? Or is it a factor? But it's certainly not, is it the only factor? And the health of the endothelium, and now we're learning just recently about endothelial glycocalyx, and I think you're quite familiar with that. Yeah, it's actually one of the hottest topics at this meeting this uh, month because there's a natural um, agent that is bolstering the 
the thickness and the uh, function of the glycocalyx it could potentially be a game changer. Mm. But if it, if it were pharma, I'd be studied in a large trial. We'd probably know in a couple of years, but it's just a small little company that has a seaweed product that improves your, uh, and actually they've got some new data about plaque regression with uh, both, with improving the uh, quality of your glycocalyx. Kind of cool stuff. That, I mean, it's real esoteric, but again, it could be a game changer if it were a, uh, a farmer driven uh, product. But yeah, I mean, I do not have an answer for you, um, you know, why you have gaps between your prox LED lesion and your mid LED lesion. And the mid at left anterior descending doesn't have as many uh, branch points. Just typically you might see a second uh, more severe. Now, pathologically, Bill Roberts will tell you, you got atherosclerosis up and down that artery if you really look with histopathology um, mm. that there isn't anything there isn't such a thing called single vessel coronary disease which is language of cardiology there's always three vessel coronary disease if you really i mean he's a coroner so he can slice and dice but if you really look carefully there is some degree of atherosclerosis it's just a range and we're used to talking only about the most severe parts the other slide on there the other portion of that is what frequently comes up about the discordance it's really ivor's question before why not use ldl in a risk marker because it's you know we can't throw it out there's too much too many studies too many uh, uh too much um practice experience and tradition of, of measuring and using ldl to discuss with patients therapy but particularly in people with metabolic syndrome it's uh not an ideal marker and ldlp is a much more predictive marker of atherosclerosis so i'm sure you you know that slide has come up before i'm sure with other interviews you've had but you know, it would be cool to look if we could put LDLP in a risk marker and replace total cholesterol with yeah. it. You would presume it'd be a better uh, I, I would prediction. Presume, yeah. I would definitely be interested. All right. So Fred question. asks, yeah. is there data on heart attack strokes among people with high LDLP and LDLC, but with good AIP, uh, that's yeah. short for atherogenic index of plasma? Ah, oh, that was autoimmune protocol. Okay. There's, there's a few AIP abbreviations out there. I'd be willing People, to bet. That's people refer to a diet as a AIP diet, uh, autoimmune protocol diet. Oh, oh yeah. good. Uh, I'm pretty sure you so mean atherogenic index of plasma. Okay. Uh, no you. no type 2 diabetes, no or controlled uh, HBP, uh, high blood pressure, I assume. Yeah. And consistently low or no CAC. And he puts in parentheses asking for a friend. But before, before you answer that, yeah. we're not giving any medical advice yeah. here, and you should never take medical advice from. So you're only just speaking yeah. in general. Where if this isn't to your friend, just to emphasize. There's a little Vegas story. There's a famous Vegas comedian, um, Penn Gillette. Yeah, the yeah. Rio, Penn and Teller. And he's a phenomenal book called Presto. That's just worth reading because he is one of the funniest human beings in the world. Absolutely. Yeah, and the book is called Presto, How I Made Over 100 Pounds Disappear in Three Months. And the book is just full of tremendously interesting uh, tips on how he did it. But his, he opens the book. If you're so stupid to take medical advice from a comedian that juggles, you just put this book down. because <laughs> I'm just a dumb idiot. And this is what I did. Don't you dare ever, you know, think that this is a medical textbook. So it's, right, uh, right. actually the guy that coached him is a, a lipid expert named Ray Cronice, who you might have a very interesting future conversation with. I hmm. mean, uh, all he does is read literature all day long. They do read literature all day long. So uh, he's a biohacker. End up on the plant-based part of the spectrum after you know deep, deep, deep dive. I think he's plant positive, but I don't know that if you know the plant positive. Yeah, series. I do actually. I, think yeah, I, I mean, nobody knows who uh, who that is, but Ray's the smartest human I've ever met uh, next to you and Ivor. So going back to the question, can you have? A, I mean, the question doesn't really make sense because if you have a calcium score is zero. But he wants to know, can you have coronary disease with a high LDLP or high LDL, but all those other factors absent? Right. But the last part of that sentence was? Uh, no or controlled high blood pressure and consistently low or no CAC. So, you, I mean, if you can you have a high LDL or high LDLP and a calcium score is zero? I think he's saying, is yeah. there data on heart attack strokes? And for okay. what it's for, worth? For risk of heart attack stroke. For what it's worth, <clears throat> I, I think that... I think that the answer is uh, yes mm -hmm. on the existing AIP studies, uh, the atherogenic index okay. of plasma. But I, but that's kind of a yeah. loose. The closest estimate. I can get to giving an answer, a calcium score of zero is highly predictive of near complete freedom for three, five, six, seven years of risk of myocardial infarction, cardiac death. But it's not 100%. Right. 
Right. And in my entire career, and I probably ordered and you know, participated in patient care for calcium scoring referrals, much as probably anybody in the United States, because I got involved in calcium scoring 20 years ago, really, really at the beginning. I've had one patient with a calcium score of zero that was in the emergency room seven months later with a presumably soft ruptured plaque that required a stent. He didn't die. I mean, that is the single one I know of um, that always sticks in my head. The other observation is I don't stop with a calcium score zero. I will usually do a CIMT on these yeah. people. And I'm the only practice in the state of Michigan that offers CIMT. It's extremely frequent to see plaque in the carotids with a calcium score of zero. Now, right. it's not in the big databases and a lot of the leading Just curious, experts. Did you see my... My CIMT. I, I've data seen in the, the series, reason. yeah. And you, make you, it. and you saw where it jumped up after yeah. I did Standard American for a while. Yeah, Whew. yeah I know. It's crazy. It was, uh, yeah. And again, you know, most people never have a CIMT. Most don't have a serial ones. I do about yearly on patients because they have to pay for it. And I'm a little uh, uh, conscious of that. And also, it goes down, it gets better. But it's pretty routine. It's not in the literature. Calcium score is zero less than 20% plaque that still needs attention to cardiovascular risk factors. Now, um, so this person, and I'd really suggest to anybody that has, if they're doing keto and their cholesterol's up and their hyperabsorber and their calcium score was done like Sean Baker, zero, that's not enough for me. I want to go yeah. one step further because you may be missing, you know, the phase of atherosclerosis that, you know, maybe, who knows, maybe keto diet, you don't calcify as much. There's no reason I have, a, or, or maybe it's just earlier in the phase, but if you have plaque, you need to be addressing yeah. it. You don't want your LDLP to be 3,000, I believe, if you've got some. And let me, by the way, just emphatically yeah. agree with you because in the sense that um, that I may have cautious optimism that I'll mention with regard right. to having high LDL but a good otherwise metabolic profile, uh, I also like to actually verify with frequent testing. Like yeah. it's, it's still theoretical, right? Even even if you're claiming right. the other side doesn't know for sure, that doesn't mean you know for sure. So why not go well, ahead and, and you know, treat it like something that you want to understand better. That's a good, I agree. If you're a medical doctor, and I'm not casting stones at Sean Baker, but I was on his podcast, I mean, by far the only vegan physician that's been on his podcast. I mean, to go a year and to, as an MD, talk to a community that respects the fact to graduate medical school and not do your blood work for a year or any other biomarker or any other imaging, you know, and then, you know, take tremendous heat on that when he was on the Rogan show and finally do it. And I would not call his blood work. I do not want his LDL of 150, his testosterone of 230, and his uh, hemoglobin A1C of 6.3. That's about what it was. I mean, I don't have him memorized. I mean, it's tremendous. He had a calcium score of zero, but he's been on this diet for 14 months. I mean, atherosclerosis is a slow and progressive process, and he needs, and all others should do good blood work. And, if they can access arterial imaging, should at least get a baseline. I mean, some people, and that is my greatest concern, are adopting this diet, not aware that they are like the pace of trial. I mean, fraught with silent atherosclerosis, and they may not be doing the right, you know, uh, the the right program for stabilizing that and preventing it. Now, not like I have a practice full of keto failures that are having events. Nobody will say that, but <laughs> it, you know, this is again, this is a five, ten, fifteen, twenty year disease process. So, you know, six months, three months, eighteen months is pretty short game to assess if it's working for a single individual or not. So we have we have about another 15, 20 minutes. I actually cool. want to pay you a huge compliment. Uh, there were a lot of people who were warning me early on that you would just be dropping the bomb on all sorts of uh, appeals to authority. And, ah. and I, have, I have to, right now, absolutely concede. I don't know that you brought it up once. Uh, well, well, I will say, you know what, um, and Twitter's a weird place. It's a weird place. You know, <laughs> it it's is. a weird place to hang out. <laughs> and you can say whatever you want because you hardly ever meet the person. I mean, this is the first person you've interviewed that you sat with. But um, and I will say, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to cross the fence and have a conversation respecting there's a lot of smart people in the world. I mean, you've got to be a jerk to say you know everything. I mean, that's not the case. But it's also to deny that the process of going through medical school or chiropractic school or osteopathic school or naturopathic school, whatever it is, and the, and the training and the patient care, that that's of no value, which is what I get thrown at me all the time. Right, right. Being summa cum laude, publishing 150 scientific papers and caring for thousands and thousands and thousands of people is of no value is as ludicrous as saying that it means you're always right and everybody else I mean, Nathan Pritikin would have, you know, not have made a difference in the world. And you can think of many other examples of that. So I, I, I always like to think of it as a head start. 
Yeah, I always like to, I always like to say, look, you should you should <laughs> if you have a question about something, you probably want to start with the experts on that question. Right. Now, past that point, it is true, I and I do try to tell people this, you know, you should still see doctors like you see your accountants or your plumbers or your anybody who's an expert in that area and still take ownership of your own health. Understand there are second opinions. There are other places for which you can get further information. Right. Just be mindful of, yeah, I and I'm the same way. I, I encourage people to work with their doctors. I don't right. want people to, um, and, yeah. but by the same token, is it true that there are doctors who may not, you know, agree with your goals or they have a different outlook that may turn out well, not to be right? Another common thing with plant-based eaters, they get beat up by their physician all the time. I mean, and they're doing something that's got some pretty decent literature support to adopt a plant-based diet for either prevention or treatment. I mean, they, they just, they get routinely recommended to add back food by a group of physicians that generally are not very well-schooled in nutrition. So uh, it works. You know, uh, and there are places where we just totally agree. I just, yeah. I really wish that a large portion yeah. of medical school was now devoted to yeah, nutrition, nutrition on the yeah. things, on the things I think you and I, and almost 90% of yeah. people right now would agree on, right, right, like right. more yeah, whole right. food, for right. example, like this is no brainer. Um, okay. So next one, we're going to get one more crit. Oh, I'm going to get one more from this and then I'm going to go to the chat. Okay. So uh, if anybody has any questions in the chat, be sure to hashtag cholesterol science so that Siobhan knows, uh, to use your question in particular, but she already has a few that are lined up. Uh, so Chris asks, we know meat has many bioavailable nutrients. My question is, what comes along for the ride with meat that you find to be a problem for humans, all ethical reasoning aside? Any? Sure. No, I get it. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, and I mean, there's a list. Um, what comes along with meat other than the amino acids that you know, may be important uh, for sustaining health, but that can be gotten from other sources and such. I mean, uh, you know, the hot one right now, and we jump right in, is you, know, you need, it, like a lot of things, you need L-carnitine to support healthy muscle function, healthy heart function. And you need a, an abundance of L-carnitine, one of the amino acids that's going to be found much more in meat than in most plant-based choices. And if your microbiome is of a, a certain constitution, will that L-carnitine be converted and become through the pathway that is now well popularized be TMAO and elevate your TMAO levels. Uh, in the European Heart Journal, December 10th, 2018 is the largest study so far, clearly linking not white meat, not uh, plant foods, but red meat to raising, um, doubling uh, blood TMAO levels, trimethyl and amine oxide levels which are measurable. There's only one lab in the United States. That's another interesting biomarker. It's called Cleveland Heart Lab. It's owned by Quest now, so it's widely available that you can get your blood TMAO level, and it's not expensive. Uh, do, do they offer that through LabCorp by chance? No, no. Quest bought Cleveland Heart Labs. Quest is the only place that has access to it. You have to have a special lab slip that, actually not anymore. You could just, any doc prescription. Um, I don't, there's no place I know of you can go buy a TMAO test you're going to need it probably on a prescription from a medical doctor. I don't, if you want to, say, I don't want to sound like I'm brand loyal or anything. Yeah, I know. Use, I, use the lab core. If yeah. you want to know your two male level, I'll give you a script, and, you know, but you're going to have to go to Quest Lab. Um, and since Ivor brought it up a couple days ago, I mean, the science that's exploded since 2011 on TMAO is that there is a relationship between your blood level and the amount of atherosclerosis in over 4,000 people that had cardiac catheterization at the Cleveland Clinic. That by no means proves the point, but, but it, it was the initial finding that set them on their hunt. And then they hunkered down in the lab and they showed that elevated TMAO levels, whether they come from eating meat rich in carnitine, eggs rich in choline, or even more powerfully supplements that are gonna be more concentrated sources of carnitine particularly, will cause platelet aggregation, powerfully platelet aggregation, which is the trigger of a lot of acute myocardial infarction, acute stroke, will um, cause less reverse cholesterol transport by HDL, which is not probably a very good thing to happen, and actually promotes, they call it forward atherosclerosis, which is a term I have only seen in the TMAO literature, but promotes foamy cell formation and macrophage engulfing of LDL. The TMAO in a, in a, in a petri dish will actually cause those uh, functions to happen. So whether it's a biomarker or whether it's actually promoting atherosclerosis is still early in the game. Uh, it's seven years of literature on it. Uh, robust, more than a thousand. You know, Ivor found too. There's more than a thousand peer-reviewed original papers 
uh, that at a minimum linked to MAO has a very powerful biomarker in stable coronary disease, unstable coronary disease, congestive heart failure, hypertension, diabetes, the kidney population for sure. There is some data that TMAO is associated with advanced kidney scarring, may actually cause kidney fibrosis, which be another mechanism of disease. Um, so that's, uh, you know, that's in the news everywhere because of this new European Heart Journal study that most people should take a look at and read. Um, and the senior author is a friend of mine, and if he has access to a bunch of labs and you want to do a back study on uh, triglyceride HDL ratios and uh, such, uh, we probably could arrange it. He's a very open-minded guy, and he's, you know, no, not, not pro-vegan. He's just a scientist, like a lot of these people. They're agnostic also in terms of diet. Um, there's something called 5 new GC, which is a inflammatory, uh, uh, I don't know if it's fair to call it a cytokine, let's just call it a molecule that's much more concentrated in meat. Um, there are studies that at least factory farm meat will raise C-reactive protein and it may be 5 new GC that is that inflammatory stimulus, maybe less so with, you know, uh, uh, grass-fed and uh, wild game. Certainly it's known for wild game that's going to raise uh, inflammation less. I mean, the saturated fat content, uh, metabolic endotoxemia, I don't know if you guys discussed that in previous shows, but the fact that a meal rich in saturated fat of animal origin, good piece of marbled beef with a nice hunk of butter on top like you can get at every restaurant on the strip here, will cause, um, you know, all eating stresses the gut and creates some uh, measurable change in the gut lining and release of uh, certain toxins in the blood. But it's a quick little wave that's just called eating. I mean, if you sit down and talk to a guy named Alessio Fasano, who's the head of the pediatric gastroenterology department at Harvard and the world expert on gluten and gluten biochemistry and gluten physiology and celiac disease, he'll tell you every time he eats a piece of bread, and he does eat a piece of bread as the world's uh, you know, leading expert, uh, maybe Nobel Prize winner down the road, he, he goes, I know I'm getting release of you know, endotoxin, lipopolysaccharide, bacterial breakdown products in my blood for five minutes. He goes, that's called life, that's food. We have, we have systems that deal with it. As opposed to a very high saturated fat meal, you will have sustained levels of uh, endotoxin. It's also called LPS, lipopolysaccharide, for hours and hours. Um, you can see it in animal mouse. You can see it in humans. So, that, you know, it is that be, better with grass finished and grass fed. I actually be versus, testing that, by the way. I may be yeah. connecting with Tommy Wood in um, uh, Seattle. Okay. At a certain point, we're going to yeah. be doing specifically testing against uh, endotoxins and especially right. LPS you're right in particular so um, what else is the meat you know there's an issue of preparation you can take meat and uh, you know by grilling and dry grilling and dry barbecuing create a tremendous amount of advanced glycation end products you know certainly very strong body of science very difficult to measure in uh, clinical practice even human research you know uh, um, you know uh, marinate your meat marinate your meat well you won't do it because of the carbs but um, Marinating your meat in a dark bear eliminates 60, 70 percent of advanced medication and product creation. When I want grow. all those medication and products. Just you love that stuff. Yeah, just, it's good for your brain. Yeah. It's good for your artery. It's good for your health. Uh, you know, there's probably a couple others we could add to the list. Uh, uh, you know, that we discuss why so many epidemiologic studies associate high meat diets with the diseases that are deteriorating Western health. So we, uh, we have a question from Ravi, uh, any comment on LDL levels and infection risk? And actually, you know, it's funny <clears throat> to sort of expand on what he's saying. We kind of touched on it before and I didn't want to yeah. delve into sort of the laundry list, but right. it's something uh, uh, myself and certainly Siobhan has been looking into very deeply, all of the different things that can be associated with um, high LDL and a positive as outcome. As part, okay. and, and to the point that you may want to make in advance that I'll go ahead and already concede, the question then becomes, how can you be sure of any causality direction, right? right? But there are certainly some immunological functions that we've seen with LDL particles in that, for example, uh, they carry an alpha tocopherol, which mm -hmm. is uh, antioxidant. Right. And uh, they are in contact with reactive oxygen species in your bloodstream turning them into non-reactive products. Right. Uh, they can bind to pathogens. Yeah. And there's a lot of argument to be made that the receptors on, uh, both on the scavenger receptors, but also even on endothelial cells, LOX1, mm -hmm. uh, which can bind to oxidized LDL particles. Right. That's actually by design a part of how they're trying to contain 
and uh, maintain control. So the question then becomes how much was that actually, how much were LDL particles considered by the part of the body to be important? Because this was right. something I brought up on the podcast with yeah. Peter was, it stands to reason those people with genetic mutations that have like very low levels of LDL particles wouldn't just have a reduced chance of cardiovascular disease, which they definitely do, but they should have lower all-cause mortality because there shouldn't be any benefit on the other side of the ledger. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, I'm not deep on the infection risk of LDL. I'll let you explore that with somebody else. But I will go back, and again, I, it's... You know, one of the um, newer contributions to the discussion of the importance of LDL, the causality of LDL or LDLP and atherosclerosis has been these Mendelian randomized analyses and the ability, you know, without doing a pro to looking at six, seven, eight SNPs that uh, lower LDL cholesterol from birth by 20, by 30, by 40 milligrams per deciliter and allow you uh, to track. And um, I was a author on one of those by senior uh, physician in Detroit, Brian Ference, uh, in 2012, but now there's nearly a million people in uh, Mendelian randomized trials looking at the issue of LDL cholesterol and survival, and that's total survival. survival right, that's what, I, yeah. that's what it, I'm interested in. Yeah, and it's but one not, of the slides I have, and I oh. mean, it's... Um, Which one? It's a busy slide, yeah, you, uh, let me see. Yeah, this one? Uh, um, this one? That one right there, right. So uh, this is from the EAS. Study yeah, from yeah, last year. right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's my study of 2012 and others at all. Yeah, Brian Ference is both the senior author of the paper that I did with him, but the, he was the first author of this EAS study, and it's from there. But um, do you mind yeah. if we unpack that one just for a second? Yeah, go ahead. So, so first of all, for for the benefit of the viewer, the idea being that if you have a genetic mutation that results and higher levels of LDL cholesterol or particle count. Or lower. Or, or lower. lower yeah. Loss of function or gain of function. That right. you effectively got to cheat the system in order to have right. a true randomized controlled trial. Right. Now, I brought this up on a TS podcast. I'll bring this up with you as well. My concern is, is you really want it to do only that. The problem is, is that a lot of these like FH uh, have an additional... Um, I'm not sure if pleiotropic can be used in the negative sense, but I want to use it. No, in the I know sense. what you're saying. Right. Is, is, is have you impact? isolated one factor and not touched any others? So right. do these, do these snips. Uh, and I don't want the yeah. goalpost to be out of reach. What I'm trying to get to well, is. The, the, the PCSK9 loss of function, gain of function, which is one of the most interesting ones used in these analyses. Right. I'm not aware there's any other impact of that SNP other than. Either have reduction a, of cardiovascular yeah, disease. Well, other than just impacting PCSK9 production or excess or, or limited. But I that, mean, but that yeah, doesn't I know impact the metabolism that. of the cell. Because even FH, I mean, there's a little data about FH and HDL functionality. But, I mean, I'm unaware of dozens. I mean, what, what is in people with heterozygous FH besides 50% of the LDL receptor numbers on their liver? Um, and therefore an elevated it, it, blood LDL level. The loss of function of endothelial cells to endocytosis, those LDL right. particles. But, but what beyond that concerns you that when those enter into these randomized studies, that we're, we're not accounting for other deleterious health effects of that genetic mutation? And again, I'm aware of a little data that HDL may not be as functional in FH so it may not be purely an LDL play. Right, it could also be. But I don't, strong. but that, that data is there, it's not very strong. I don't know any others, like. Well, and that's what I'm getting yeah. to is what well, I, You could say lipoprotein A, you know, it partly it impacts thrombosis through plasminogen. And we have the problem that it, LP little a is not tracked enough. Like it would be great if we also could capture that because a lot of times LDLs right. being it's, looked at right. wouldn't right. 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 right, right, right. But no, to, to, to your point, Really, kind of to, to my point overall, what I'd love to do is grab every SP, and I'm not a genetic right. researcher, but if I could, I'd grab every SP and subtract all of those that in any way impact the health of the cell, and in particular endothelial cells. Okay. Because if they don't have any impact on lipid metabolizing of the endothelial cells, you can say that's off the table. And like glycogen storage disease is one of my favorite examples of this. They tend to have, like a GSD 1A, okay. will have dyslipidemia. Right. Yeah, but huge levels. Other, yeah, but but they don't have atherosclerosis. They, in fact, a lot of times they'll have an even thinner intermediate layer, and they've tried to study what it is that's special about them right. that makes it happen. 
I think what's special about them is because they can't store glycogen, they're basically being pushed into being a hyper responder. They have to metabolize more of these uh, uh, energy stores, but they don't have the likewise other problem in that there's not a receptor mutation that creates an issue for the endothelial cells themselves. Okay. Again, theoretical, but that's why like, I, I have a tough time with this Mendelian randomizations and that I want to say, look, either A, let's do one where it's all of them, all right. of the SNPs, and then look at like longevity. Right. Or let's at least do the SNPs that don't associate those that would, you know, have an impact on the health of the cell, especially endothelial right. cells. And, and just, I know we don't have hours more, go to, it's the last slide again. I just want to, I want, maybe not. Oh, you know, I apologize. It's, um, this one? Yep, yeah, right there. Gotcha. Which again, I cheated again. I put two in one. I, so you're on slide four. Thank you, Siobhan, for letting me cheat putting two in one. And, you know, the one of the arrows on the left is, I believe, oh, it's down there. It's, um, is it EAS? No, it's this newer paper than the EAS paper with some very interesting summary, and I suggest people read it. But the the pillars is Dr. Walter Longo. And there's a point. I mean, the Mendelian, so this is his construct specifically how you analyze nutrition science, but it's also a concept that can be used to analyze most fields of science, like the role of LDL in development of atherosclerosis. It, it, it is based on, there's no single study, no single approach that you know wins the day. So Mendelian randomization studies are one piece of looking at pathology, biochemistry, randomized studies, you know, right. epidemiology. Um, you know, and, and I got knocked down on the Rogan show for mentioning you know, usually we're taking the entirety of the data and we're going to shift and we're going to, you know, uh, reevaluate. But um, flaws in Mendelian studies uh, don't discount that it's still consistent and uh, it's supportive of the idea that it uh, certainly uh, in the practice of medicine, approaching LDL as an atherosclerotic factor is necessary. And I mean, this is a good construct even for you. What, what's interesting is not only is Walter Longo, who some of your listeners know who, they are, who he is, and some who don't probably should uh, read some of his science as the leading nutrition biochemist in the world in Los Angeles based, but all over. But when you look at uh, Michael Brown and Joe Goldstein and their Nobel Prize in 85, and as they write in a paper called a century of cholesterol 2016. It's an hour long YouTube you'd enjoy. Uh, Michael Brown discussing, you know, the broad strokes from 1913 to 2015, uh, what we've learned about cholesterol. He uses the exact same model, although the two have never met and never discussed that, you know, when he looks across the entire spectrum, is LDL causal atherosclerosis, epidemiology, randomized studies, centenarian studies, basic biochemistry, of which he contributed so much. Um, it's a very good framework of which to analyze, you know, um, and the, the issues that you've dedicated, you know, you're dedicating your life to. Uh, don't get so focused on you know, necessarily one topic. You want to you use all the tools there and try and be as consistent as you can, which favors in conventional medicine that LDL is a big deal and something we should be tracking and something we should be modifying. Well, we should actually probably wrap up. It's uh, now 90 minutes in. How wow. We... Yeah, it goes fast, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no. Um... I mean, this has been fascinating. I mean, it would be inappropriate for me to tell me you're, tell you you're, you're you're wrong and you're you know poorly trained. I mean, that's <laughs> didn't plan to do it. I didn't really have a, uh, you know, I mean, we all study the medical literature, and um, you you know, we need skeptics to point out flaws, and then we need as a community to you know respond to them. And um, I would encourage you to continue, you know, these debates. I could give you some other people, like Ray Cronice. I think you should have him on the show. I think you two would oh, yeah, have yeah. an engaging, uh, I don't know whether he'd want to, but uh, an engaging conversation, um, you know. Um, but I do, my as a physician, we've said this, but I really would love the low-carb community, you know, to monitor their health, to monitor their labs, to monitor their arterial health. Um, you know, the American Heart just came out with a very strong statement which I think is pertinent to the low-carb community. If your doc is pushing a statin on you, you might want to be getting a calcium score. And if you're zero, you might be in a reasonable place to say you want to work you know, without uh, medical uh, intervention on that. Um, but I just, you know, I, I, I lecture to my vegan communities. 
I don't care that you've eaten this way for six months or 16 months or maybe occasionally six to eight years, which is where I'm, I'm an outlier that's been 40 years. You know, don't assume you're healthy and get checked. I mean, you know, the, the, this it's just uh, there's a, uh, I would say an arrogance that comes up where we're all diet elitists. But, you know, um, you know, we, we lost to what Charles Harlequin. Was that his name? Uh, the, the trainer, like in late September, this, you know, ripped kind of paleo uh, world. You don't know who I'm talking about? I, yeah, I, yeah I, you know, again, I don't it, it just grieves me. And it's not pointing out that he made horrible mistakes in his life. I don't know anything about him to say that, but it grieves me that people die suddenly of heart disease that can be checked. So it's always, I, my, I totally agree. always my platform is you want to go off and do some cool biohacking, go for it, but at least yeah. be smart enough to get the numbers in. You, know you could are. not be talking to a bigger advocate. Yeah. No, you're, I assume you're in I, your 30s. You're a young guy, which puts you in a better place. You know, my 40s. But oh yeah, okay. <laughs> but you know, you start doing this in your mid 50s and in the 60s. You, not necessarily playing with fire, but to do it blindly is just you know, just not recommended. Well, again, I, uh, thank you for coming on. You bet. Where can people find you? Um, I'm staying right up the street. Oh yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry. But a bump. Yeah, it's Everybody, a, rush the hotel. But a bump. Um, yeah, I'm taking a red eye back to Detroit tonight. I'm going to screw up my uh, my circadian rhythm. Uh, DrJoelKahn.com. D-R-J-O-E-L-K-A-H-N.com. In Detroit. See patients. Uh, run own three restaurants, which is a very, very bad thing to do for <laughs> Talk about heart disease risks, yeah, right? I mean, we're, we're, we're <laughs> loving it, but oh my God, is it hard work? That is the uh, hardest. That is, by the way, one of the riskiest yeah, business risk ventures is. there are. It, I, it is rewarding. And I feel a lot of days on like Ted dancing behind the bar, cheers. And, you know, you really have some wonderful, wonderful Am I people. wrong in that Detroit isn't exactly the mecca of. Like I would think, if you were setting up a new vegan restaurant, yeah. it would be like yeah. in the heart of San Francisco, yeah, or LA, San like Francisco, that. New York. Um, yeah. But it's proliferating everywhere. Okay, it's just a good, healthy place to eat. You know, it's uh, we get a lot of. I actually push it to the paleo community because you know we're dairy free. It's easy. We're largely gluten free. It's an easy place for paleo people to eat. But anyways, I'm in Detroit. People can come visit me. Okay, great. And um, I will probably be at Paleo FX in April. Um, oh. Michelle was interested in having a plant physician to have a conversation, so I'll get to meet a few more of these people that are beating me up on Twitter on occasion oh. <laughs> that I beat up. But well, they, uh, whatever people say to you, the one thing that I think you've demonstrated over and over again, consistently, I get a lot is a willingness to meet the other side. Yeah, and I applaud. I think that. so. Yeah, I gotta happen. It. Gotta happen. Yeah. Well, thank you guys all for joining us, and thank you. we'll wrap it up here. Let me. Uh, just get it back to the original window. See you later.